All right, we're back for another one. And we're going to talk about a, an interesting little uh, curiosity that turns up when we start looking out into the universe and looking at the redshifts of galaxies, how much their light has been shifted. And there's something weird called quantized redshifts. So what are, what are quantized redshifts, Geraint? Okay, so let's, uh, let, let's just think about where this is coming from. When we talk about cosmology, right, we talk about uh, what, what's now known as the Big Bang expanding universe model, right? And what we have is that uh, one of the key things that is written into that is that the universe is isotropic and mm -hmm. homogeneous. So homogeneous means it's the same everywhere. Isotropic means it looks the same no matter which direction you look, right? So this is one of the underlying assumptions in, in modern cosmology. It goes into the equations and that's what how we describe the universe. Yeah. And so what you would expect is that when I look out into the universe, what I'm going to see is a, a, a view that that patch of sky over there and that patch mm -hmm. of sky over there look the same other than the fact that, you know, there are some random bits that the numbers of galaxies might be slightly different, et cetera. Yeah. But I should expect to see redshifts over there and redshifts over there, et cetera. Right. So, so, so this has proven to be, you know, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but when you start to look at people who dislike the cosmological model, they say things like, well, what we see are quantized redshifts. Mm -hmm. And what, what they mean by that is that when I look out into the universe, I, I see individual galaxies, they are redshifted. So that means that the further away the galaxy is, the faster it's moving with respect to me. And so I'd expect that a galaxy here, a galaxy there, a galaxy here, et cetera, and there would be red shifts. And over there, the galaxies are slightly different places, and it would be more and more red shifted as we go to large distances. What the quantized redshift claim is, is that this idea that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic is not correct because when we look out and we ask the question of what are the redshifts of the galaxies, instead of being essentially randomly scattered and getting larger as we go to large distance, that they come in clumps. Mm -hmm. That I look out, I see not very much, and then I see a lot of galaxies at one redshift. I keep looking out, I see not very much, I see a lot of galaxies, another redshift. And some people have claimed that there is actually an intricate pattern. One, two, three, like the quantized levels in an atom yeah. that galaxies sit at quantized distances away from us. Or they have quantized redshifts. They could be randomly scattered, but yeah. the redshift is not due to the expansion of space. It's something else which makes them all have very similar redshifts. So this, this, this comes back to sort of trying to test the sort of Big Bang picture of the universe if we're right, if that, if that theory is correct, that, you know, galaxies just form out there in the universe, but the whole universe as a whole is expanding. We should on, at some level, if things are, as you said, homogeneous, isotropic, I should see, you know, this redshift and that redshift, this, there shouldn't be any special redshifts. Like there aren't any special distances out there in the universe. So if we looked out there and, you know, all the redshifts, you know, we're all, you know, there's a, there's a real fondness for everyone having a redshift of 0.2 or something. That would be kind of weird. So that's, yes. that's the claim here. That's right. And so this is a claim that still circles quite a bit when you look at alternative cosmology mm -hmm. sites. Um, what is rather telling is when you go to the literature and you read the papers that these people claim are provided evidence for these quantized redshifts. So these are often papers from 30 to 40 years ago. Yes. If not a little bit older. And that's important, right? Because 30 to 40 years ago, when people wanted to ask the question of, well, what's the, the redshifts of galaxies? For the vast majority of galaxies, we don't know what the redshifts are. Yeah. And to, to get them, you, it takes effort. You've got to go out there, you've got to point your telescope, you've got to collect light from that galaxy, get the spectrum, look at where the um, absorption and emission lines are in that spectrum, compare them to your laboratory and find out how much that galaxy is redshifted. Yeah. So in the good old days, there were two things that you could do. 
you could either do what's known as a wide, shallow survey. Mm -hmm. I, I look over a large part of the sky, but I'll only look at things which I think are relatively close to me because they will be relatively bright mm -hmm. and I'll be able to, my, my measurements should be relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the problem there, of course, is that you're only really, if you think about looking at the universe, you're only looking in a, essentially a little bubble around you yeah. and there's all the rest of the universe to explore. Right. The other is you do a narrow, deep survey, mm -hmm. which is effectively keyhole surgery on the universe. You say, right, I'm going to take precisely that line of sight. I'm going to find all the galaxies along that line of sight. And I'm going to measure their redshifts. And the nearby ones, that's going to be easy. But as I go to f larger and larger distances, the galaxies become fainter and fainter. Mm -hmm. It becomes harder and harder to measure their redshifts. And so you're going to have to use more and more time staring at it with your instrument. Exactly, right. exactly. And there's this, there's this famous, I mean, we should talk about um, scientific uh, approaches to science at some point. But, you know, one of the key phrases that we have in science and especially yeah. in astronomy is this concept of signal to noise. Yeah. Right? Because when you collect data, you collect the signal, mm -hmm. the thing that you're interested in. But accompany are sources of noise. Um, and especially when you're looking at fainter sources, you've got to worry about the fact that you're collecting individual photons coming up in and they're coming in like drips from a tap. And so there's a variation due to the fact that you're counting small numbers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So signal to noise is one of these key concepts which you rarely hear spoken about in descriptions of popular science. But for astronomers, it's, it's make or break. That's what tells you how much time you need to spend yeah. looking at an object to get enough signal to measure what you want to mention, measure. And one of the key aspects is that signal to noise, if I've got a particular galaxy, the longer I observe, the better the signal to noise gets, but it increases as the, uh, the square of the time. So if I want to make my signal twice as strong, Mm -hmm. I've got to observe for four times as long, Yeah. right? So when I get down to the faintest galaxies, I could spend an entire night on one galaxy collecting photons for me to get to my measurement. And so, so it was hard work, right? Because you could really only look at one galaxy at a time. So, so, so I was going to say, the earliest claims about quantized redshift, because they had these such small samples, a, you know, small, you know, s small sample problems there as well. But the claim was really that it wasn't just that they were quantized around us. It was also that the claim was made. If you go look at a cluster of galaxies, so here's a bowl, a bunch of galaxies over here, and you pick the one in the middle, that they will appear to be clustered around that point as well. Yes. And because we're measuring redshifts, we, we can express a redshift also as a velocity. And so the claim was that there's this magic number of 72 kilometers a second. And if you're in a cluster uh, and, you're, you, and you, then you look at the other galaxies around the center of the cluster, they have a preference for multiples of that number as redshifts relative to the center. So they want to be 72 or twice 72 or three times 72 or four times 72, if you know your 72 times tables. So... That was really the sort of the first version of this claim that came out. Uh, and so we, what happened next to this claim? Well, well what happened is astronomers uh, worked out how to collect data more efficiently, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to do that in astronomy, there's two, there's two things you can do. Number one is you make your, your telescopes bigger, mm -hmm. right? So if you're limited by how often, how, much, how many photons you can get into your instrument, yeah. then if you get a bigger mirror, you get more photons, right? So that really helps. Uh, you put your telescopes above the atmosphere, right? Yeah. Hubble Space Telescope, because the shaking of the atmosphere smears your light out of your detector and your detector is quantized. It's made of little bits and you want to try and concentrate your signal into as small a number as possible. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, of course, you increase... Um, two aspects with regards to instruments. You make your detectors more sensitive. Mm -hmm. So you 
you suppress the noise from the instrument. You're still limited by the counting of photons, but the, try and suppress the noise from the instrument. And to do that, you, your, your electronic instruments now, your charge couple devices, you keep them in liquid nitrogen because mm -hmm. warmer things have more noise than colder things. Mm -hmm. And one of the other great advances has been multiplexing. And this isn't anything to do with going to the cinema, right? So multiplexing- I was gonna make that joke, you got that. Uh, multiplexing, the question was, how can I make my telescope look at more than one thing at once? Yeah. Right? And people realize there are clever ways that you can do this. You could either take your, your telescope and you could put a mask in front of your telescope. So normally what you would do, put it this way, uh, to get the light from a single galaxy, mm -hmm. I would, here's my galaxy, I would put a slit across there. So it would be a narrow, thin opening line Mm -hmm. that the light comes from. So I put my slit, I put my object in my slit and I would disperse the light and I'd get my spectrum. Right. Okay. The, the equivalent of putting it through a prism and seeing a rainbow. Exactly, exactly. Now, if you imagine that if I just had my prism and I opened it up and I'd get light from everything coming through, there would be, just be a, a mess. Yeah. So that's why I put the slit there is to limit the, the light that hits the prism. Right. Right. What people realize is that, well, instead of one slit, what if I put multiple slits? A slit here for this object, a slit here for that object, a slit here for this object, a slit here for that object, put them through the prism. And then as long as their spectra, I get one spectrum here, one spectrum here, one yeah. spectrum here. As long as they don't overlap, I could get the light from each of these objects, mm -hmm. right? So there's uh, some really impressive instruments like at, at Gemini and Keck that do precisely this. The other solution is to do what's known as multi-fiber mm -hmm. uh, spectroscopy, whereby you have your, your view of the sky seen by the telescope, but you put a little, little glass prism on each object you're interested in, and that little glass prism collects the light and then sends it down a fiber, and then that light is all rearranged into a whole series of spectra. Yeah. So this is what 2DF at the Anglo-Australian Telescope does. It can currently, um, Get, collect the light from 400 objects at a time. There are systems coming online which are going to be looking at 400, 800, 4,000 objects at a time, right? So you sort of, you try and beat the, um, the, the noise in the sense of uh, collecting lots of light in one go and collecting light from lots of objects. You can get um, lots of good data on lots of objects in one set of observations. Right. And, and what people found is that when you started to map the universe over large areas and mm -hmm. to deeper depths, so go mm -hmm. to fainter objects, they found out that the universe was structured, right? So there's this famous image from the um, Harvard survey from the late 1980s, I'm gonna say, where- Sounds about they, right. Yeah, it's called the Stickman diagram, which and you're mm -hmm. going to put a, an image. I will right now. Yeah. Right. Um, they basically measured the the redshifts to galaxies, and they saw that they were very structured. They would saw that there were effectively a big walls of galaxies across the sky, clumps of galaxies and clusters, other filaments, etc. And what was realized is that if you if you have that kind of structure then there are correlations between galaxies on the small scale. Mm -hmm. Galaxies aren't random. They yeah. are in clumps and bumps that have particular sizes. And also, if you have that sort of structure and you put a keyhole through it, you can imagine that your view will go through a bit of universe with, without very much in it. Hits yeah. a wall, so you get a big clump of galaxies, go through it, hits another wall, go that. And now the most massive surveys that people have done, things like with Sloan and the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey and all this kind of thing, you found that this sort of cosmic web, as it called, that stretches out all the way through space. And any sort of pencil beam survey that you do is going to look like it's got um, lumps at roughly regular distances because mm -hmm. structures have particular scales. But overall on average, the universe is actually smooth, right? Right. So if I look at it from a large enough viewpoint, I see that that idea of 
homogeneity and isotropy still holds. Right. So when those initial claims were made about 72 kilometers a second being a special number, if you think about the expansion rate of the universe and think how far away from me does something need to be in order to be expanding on average at 72 kilometers a second, the answer in, in astronomy units that we like is a megaparsec. So it's sort of 3 million light years ish. Now that sounds like a big distance, but it's basically the distance from us to our nearest bigger galaxy. Andromeda, it's roughly that sort of order. And on those small scales, of course the universe isn't smooth on those scales. The stuff that's here in our Milky Way had to come from somewhere. And so what the universe did very, very briefly and roughly is gravity just took this big whole section here and then just squashed it down into the Milky Way. And if you do a very rough calculation about how big does, is the bit of the universe that you need to squash down, in order to have enough stuff to make a Milky Way, it's about a megaparsec. So you have a megaparsec sized box, you make a Milky Way, the next megaparsec sized box over there makes Andromeda, our other nearest galaxy. So it's just not at all surprising that you see those sorts of structures when you look into the universe. However, quantized redshifts made a bit of a comeback in the 90s. So there was a, a paper by some, some quite respectable cosmologists using one of these larger surveys, which uh, claimed that they'd seen structure not on the level of a megaparsec, who cares, but on the level of 180 megaparsecs, which is an enormous distance in the universe, bigger than clusters, bigger than superclusters. Uh, and so these claims were made in the 90s and there were sort of back and forth about whether they were uh, uh, you know, solid or not solid and whether they turned up in, in simulations. And we've got you know, a nice discussion of all of this in our book if people wanna get more of the details. But the short story was two things. They didn't quite show up as strongly once, as you said, we got even more data. So even though this was the 90s and we could do more, it was still, that claim was still made on the basis of something like a couple of hundred galaxies. Yeah. And so, but the music was better. The music was definitely better in the 90s. I think yeah. we can all agree that on that. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so it, once we had even bigger surveys, it sort of disappeared. If you look inside, we could then, we're starting to the point where we could actually simulate big bits, big bits of the universe. And structures like this were sort of on the edge of what might turn up in a simulation. Although that, that point, once they didn't turn up as strongly in the, the larger, you know, observations the simulators weren't particularly interested in that problem anymore yeah so so there are actually sort of two separate quantization um claims the the, the boring one at a megaparsec which is kind of obvious and then the interesting one which sort of didn't quite pan out at 180 megaparsecs but but people who don't like um the expanding universe picture still trot them out as if they're a problem uh, and that shows that their thinking is at least 30 years out of date. Yeah. So one of the ways you, you want to attack, whatever, whatever, if you're one of these people who wants to try this, okay. Uh, the classic thing they do is they get a, a survey of galaxies and then they do what's called a Fourier transform on it or something like a Fourier transform to show that there's some sort of periodicity. There's some sort of regular lumpiness. Um, and just as hint, if you want to convince us that you've actually seen something, get an actual simulation of the universe, which is consistent with all the physics we have, which there are ones of those available online, like the Millennium Simulation, and apply your methodology to that and see what happens. And that's our little hint there that, that if the same sort of pattern turns up in that simulation as turns up in your little, little code that you applied to the, the galaxy, the, the actual data, then you're not really making any sort of inroads against the Big Bang Theory. I'm going to look forward to seeing their new papers in the comments below. <laughs>